All right. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6 is all we're going to read. So if you haven't found it by now, just listen closely. It says, He said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the waters of life freely. Let's pray before we get started. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the folks that came out this morning. I pray that you bless each and every one of them with everything that's said and done here in our church this morning. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts, Lord, where we have need. And Lord, if there's one here that has that great need of salvation, I pray that the Holy Spirit would deal with them and show them how to meet that great need through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for all of us who have been saved, Lord, that this message would be a message of encouragement. That this message, Lord, would help us to strive to be better witnesses in this world. So I pray you'd use it. And Lord, I pray for myself, Lord, if there's any sin unconfessed in my life, you'd forgive it of me. Lord, I want to be fit to be used by you today. So Lord, we just pray that all things bring glory to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I've titled the sermon this morning, and it's a very similar title to a book I read many years ago. It's a book about that thick, uh, called The Unfolding Drama of Redemption, and it goes through the whole Bible. And I'm not going to go through the whole Bible uh, this morning. I, I don't think everybody would bear that. Uh, but I am going to preach kind of a summary of the Bible a little bit, and I've titled the sermon, The Drama of Redemption. He says here in our text that uh, God says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. And He says, I'm the beginning and the end. And He says, it is done. What is done? Well, the plan of redemption is done. And that's what we're going to preach on today. Now, we're going to start out with this point. We're going to first start out talking about creation. Over in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, it says, On the seventh day, God ended His work. So God created everything that you see in six literal days and He rested on the seventh. Now don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If they say otherwise, uh, they are contradicting the Bible and they don't know what they're talking about. Because you can't reconcile uh, uh, the, the evolution, you cannot reconcile the Big Bang with the biblical account. And that's what you do when you try to add in all these extra years. It was not a process, this act of creation. It says, on the seventh day, he ended his work. You see what it said? He ended his work. It was done. It was complete right there. I remember what started me out thinking about this as I read a quote by Pope Francis. And I'm not a big fan of his. One of my mottos is this, there is no hope in the Pope. Amen. And you'll see what I, I get mean when I quote you what he said. This is what Pope Francis said. He said, when we read about the creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that's not so. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal law that he gave to each one of us so we could reach our fulfillment. What a bunch of baloney. Amen. I mean, I don't think God's some magician. A magician, uh, if he were, were a true magician, had to rely on magic. God did not have to rely on magic. He didn't have to give some kind of incantation. He is the all-powerful, almighty, creating God. He just spoke it into existence. Amen? I tell you, what he's trying to do here is reconcile evolution with the truth of God's Word. Uh, that's the, the same as trying to reconcile a lie with the truth. You just can't get it done. They're opposites of one another. You let us soon uh, mix oil and water as to try to mix lies and truth. Amen? If you have a creation, let me put it this way. If you have creation, there has to be a creator. Amen? If you want to know the truth about it, uh, uh, what you need to do is forget what man says and see what God says. See what thus saith the Lord is. See what the Word of God says. After all, in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Thy Word is truth. You want to know the truth of creation? Find it right here in the pages of God's book. I don't care if somebody contradicts the Word of God, whether they have a, a PhDs and DDTs and everything else. What matters is what God says. Amen? 
You need only to look to the one who was there. Who was there? Well, I'll tell you who was there. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us who was there. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'm going to depend upon the one who was there. God forbid I ask some educated college professor today or some popular religious leader such as the Pope. They don't know what they're talking about. And I tell you what, God asked Job. God said to Job, He said in Job 38.4, He said, Where was thou when I created the heavens and the earth? Let me echo that same wording to the Pope and to all these uh, secular uh, school teachers. Where were you when God uh, laid the foundation of the earth? You weren't a speck in your father's eye and your father's eye as were not even created and neither was any of your progeny. No, God was there. When there was nothing else, there was God. These men who deny God created everything. These ones who promote evolution were not there when God laid the foundation of the earth. Uh, they weren't there when God formed man from the dust of the earth. How can they stand in their classrooms or behind some lectern somewhere and openly contradict the one who was there and perform the miracle of creation with the very words from his own mouth? Amen? But you might say, well, all scientists believe in evolution. Well, I tell you what, that's a lie. Not all scientists believe in evolution. Not all scientists believe in the Big Bang. There is a number of creationists uh, today practicing the study of science. But they won't tell you that. They'll say, well, the consensus says it happens this way. Or they believe this theory. Well, I tell you what, it may be a consensus. But because it is a large group that believes a lie, doesn't make it true. How many people believe a lie does not make it true? You can actually go on Google and you can find a number of scientists today who believe in the biblical account. By the way, many founders in certain fields of science were believers. I think of a lot of them. A name guy, guy named Robert Boyle. Robert Bull defined the elements. Remember that periodic table that you had to study when you was in school? He, he, he defined the elements, the compounds, and the mixtures, and he, he come up with Boyle's Law, which is still used today. He was a Christian. He believed in a creation. Amen? I think of a, another guy, Anton uh, Lewaze. I can't even know if I said his name right. He's French. It's hard to say those names if you're from East Tennessee. But he's the founder of modern chemistry. He discovered oxygen role in combustion and in respiration. I tell you what, you think all these smart people don't believe the Bible? These are very smart men. I would say these scientists were smarter than the scientists of the day. Michael Faraday discovered electromagnetic induction. Isaac Newton spent more time studying the Bible than he did math or physics. And he profoundly changed the understanding of nature with his laws of universal gravitation and his laws of motion. He invented calculus. And I tell you, when I was in school, I'd shake my fist at Isaac Newton for inventing calculus. But he did. He was a smart man. But he believed the account in Genesis. He was a Christian. The list could go on and on. It's only in the last 165 years that man had been claiming uh, that we evolved from something else. Only 165 years out of all the time man's been on earth have they come up and concocted this foolish story. This fairy tale that man crawled out of a, or some organism crawled out of this uh, primordial soup and involved into a monkey and then involved into a human being. Only for 165 years have people believed that foolishness. A lie that did not necessarily spring from the mind of Charles Darwin, but sprung from hell itself. Amen? I need to get an amen right there. Why is this theory so precious to those that defend it? i tell you exactly why these people want to believe in evolution. Because if they believe in evolution, there is no accountability to the Creator. If there's no Creator, they won't have to stand in front of Him, they think, or they suppose. But i got news for them. Whether they believe there's a Creator or not, they're still going to stand in front of Him. 
And when their names are not found written in the book of life, they will be cast into the lake of fire uh, forever and ever and ever. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. I read on the bumper sticker one time it says, uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. But uh, that, that's not right. It doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. It's just God said it, and that settles it. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said it, and that settles it. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it explains it a little bit. It says, it sums it up. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's when man started turning away from believing in the great Creator. Their foolish heart was darkened. They became vain in their imaginations. I tell you, what imaginations could it be talking about? Well, I tell you, what, the imagination that everything exploded. I mean, that nothing exploded and made everything. That's out of imagination, isn't it? Amen. All these cavemen, that's imagination. I get sick and tired of cavemen. Huh? I mean, this is what they want you to believe, that, that man crawled out of that primordial, that, that an organism crawled out of that primordial suit, it began to evolve, it turned into a monkey, so on and so forth, and then it turned into some man that went around grunting with a club. Dragging around women by the hair like Brother Charlie just said. That's all made up, that's their foolish imagination. Adam was a very intelligent man, probably the smartest man that ever lived because his genetics were perfect being the first creation in the image of God. And by the way, he named every animal. You don't read in the Bible that God brought by of the animals and he went... Ooh, ooh, ooh. No, he said, that's a zebra. He said, that is a giraffe. Now, that is a hippopotamus. Huh? He was an intelligent being. Not some foolish thing dragging its knuckles around. He was made in the image of God. If you believe in caveman, you must think that God's a caveman. If you think the first men could not speak, you must believe that God cannot speak. The Bible says that God made man in His own image. You can't get any clearer than that. Another theory followed a Darwin's theory there in 1927. It was formalized by a man named George Lamontre, if I'm saying his name right, another French guy. And by the way, he was also a Catholic priest, no less. He come up and popularized the Big Bang Theory. Huh? The Big Bang Theory. I'm not going to go deep into this this morning because i got a lot of ground I want to cover. But it all boils boils down to this: the Big Bang theory postulates that matter made itself. Matter made itself. That means all the things that you see. That's matter. Everything's made out of matter. Made itself. Nothing makes itself, does it? But the Bible teaches that God created everything. So uh, you have in the beginning rocks or you have in the beginning God. It doesn't take a, a scientist to figure out which one of those makes more sense. See, something has to be eternal, doesn't it? Something always had to have been here. Right? Either non-thinking matter like a rock somehow produced life or a living God is eternal and He made everything. Tell me which one's easier to believe. You have to be a dummy to think rocks made everything. I mean, how come our parking lot hasn't risen up and started making things? No matter how much time you had, and that, that's, the, that's, what they, that's their magic word, is time. That's why they want billions and billions of years, because it makes their, their logic seem more plausible. But it don't if you think about it. Time is not some magic thing that you mix in. They can fix all problems. I mean, it don't matter how much time you add in, it'll never uh, make all the, com the, the, the uh, complexities of the universe. I mean, look into that telescope and see all the universe is spread out before you. See the order of the universe and they can tell where planets are by making calculations. Everything is directed by math because there's a creator who is very smart. 
who is omniscient. Look into that microscope and see all the microorganisms and all of their parts and how they work. And look at the, 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 all the, the elements and, and what they're made out of and all their primary pieces. We know that there's a God. See, time is an enemy to complexity. Amen? And order. Time unwinds things. It doesn't set anything in order. Huh? Has, has time helped you with your vitality? I mean, if you keep adding time to yourself, do you get feeling better? No. I mean, you, you, you might be sick and get feeling better with a little bit of time mixed in there. But just add, add 80 years on there and see how it makes you feel. Time does not fix everything. Time unwinds everything, right? Things don't get better with time. Things get worse with time. Put your tent outside and leave it out there all summer and see what happens to it. What happens? Time keeps marching on and it starts to destroy and pick those things apart. Time doesn't improve your car. Time does not improve your house. Time unwinds. So I tell you, if you want to throw millions and billions of years in there, I tell you, things will just be all in disarray and destroyed. I mean, it's even a law of science, the law of, of entropy, of things tend towards disorder. I've never woken up from sleeping at night and my hair all be in place. But I sure have woke up from sleeping and my hair have cow licks all over the place. It didn't go into order with that time that I slept. No, it went into disorder. Amen. Explosion does not put things in order. Never has, never will. Go set you a bomb off in the, in, the, in, the, in the landfill and see how many things get put together. God created everything. Amen? He did it in six literal days and He rested on the seventh. Genesis 1 says, 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I quoted to you already John 1 where it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Bible tells us on the sixth literal day God made man. Listen, Genesis 1.27 God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. Who did it? God did. Time didn't do it. Some uh, lightning bolt hitting some primordial soup made out of rocks didn't do it. God did it. He made them in His image too. Not some paramecium to monkey uh, to a, a caveman. God made them. And, uh, and, and He made them good. Amen? Everything God made, He made good. Huh? You know, if you read the Genesis account, it says, God made this on this day, and He saw that it was good. On this day, He made this, and He saw that it was good. On this day, He made this, and He saw that it was good. It was all good when God made it. Adam was perfectly made in God's own image. Eve was perfectly made from the side of a man, which I think is very uh, interesting because uh, he, she is to be beside the man. Amen? She was called a help me to meet uh, somebody that's acceptable for him. Uh, she completed the man. You know, man, you're half a person. Woman, you're half a person. But when you unite the man and the woman in marriage, we become one. Amen. And then we're completely made whole when you get God in the mix. Amen. Man and woman were perfect for God to fellowship with. But you know what? It didn't stay that way. There came a degradation. Now the first point in my sermon is creation. Now we get to degradation. Uh, we're going to talk about the degrading power of sin. See, creation was perfect. God said it was good. Man and woman were perfect, yet somehow they were changed. How did this happen? How did man become not good? After all, the Bible says there's none that doeth good. There's none good. No, not one. There's none righteous. No, not one. I mean, look at the earth today. It's far from good. You say, why? 
I know you listen to Louis Armstrong sing, oh, what a beautiful world, but I tell you what, it's not that beautiful. It's full of evil people. Right? I mean, we got to the point where people are murdering babies. Amen. We got evil people. There's some places you shouldn't go. And you put your life in peril if you go there. Because there's evil people today. I mean, look at the concentration camps in World War II. There is evil people in the world. Say amen. amen. There's cemeteries all across uh, this planet. Huh? There's dead things laying on its surface and there is dead things buried beneath. When you go pump gas, uh, that used to be living things. Huh? Probably crushed under the flood in Noah's day. Amen. Police stations. Why do we need police stations? Because people are evil. Amen. There's crisis centers where battered women and children go to. Why do we have those? Because people are evil and the world is no longer good. We have thorns and thistles and earthquakes. Why? Because the world is not good anymore. There's disease and famine and pestilence. There is still war. And I don't understand why we have war, but we do. Because men are evil. Got to have more and more and more and more power. Mankind as they are is far from good. The world is far from good. Now, what happened? Well, the, uh, to, uh, look, look here. The Bible confirms this whole thing in, in Romans 3, 12. And I already alluded to this. It says, but they are gone out of the way. Talking about mankind. They are altogether unprofitable. Mankind is unprofitable, it says. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And man uh, continues to spiral further and further from the standard that God has set up for them. And it gets worse year after year. Men get worse. And their hearts get more evil and more dark. And our thoughts are on evil continually like in Noah's day. We are devolving. Yeah, I say I don't believe in evolution. But I do tell you I believe in devolution. It's going the opposite way. Men aren't getting smarter. They're getting dumber. I mean right now a lot of people don't even know what a woman is anymore. They don't know basic things anymore. We've got dumber and dumber and dumber. We've not got smarter and smarter and smarter. And the reason we're getting dumber is because we're walking further and further into the darkness by forgetting God. Like to not retain the knowledge of God in our minds. What happened? God made man for fellowship. That's why, well, that's why we were made. God could fellowship with man in the garden because we were both perfect. Talking about Adam and Eve and God. They were perfect. They could fellowship one with another. But when man sinned, when he took of that forbidden fruit, uh, that fellowship was broken because light cannot have fellowship with darkness. Because perfection cannot have fellowship with corruption. God being holy could not commune with fallen man. Sin had separated man from God and mankind uh, would continue to be separated from God because Adam, uh, through Adam, we all pass from, from life unto death. Amen? I think of Romans 5.12. It says, Wherefore is by one man. Who's that one man? Adam. Wherefore is by one man sin into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. All because of that one man. As in Adam all die, it says. I can't stand to see somebody shake their fist at God and say, if God is God, why is there so much evil in the world? I'll tell you why there's so much evil in the world. It's man who's put it here. God made it, it was good. Man got a hold of it and he made it bad. So when somebody starts to throw that argument at you, say it's your fault. Amen. He sees that man has sinned. He sees that man is ruined. And God wants to have fellowship with man again. So God makes a plan. Since one man, Adam, uh, brought sin into the world, a uh, sin uh, must be uh, put out by one man. Uh, there is the first Adam that led us into sin, who is the head of all the human race. Uh, but Christ, the last Adam, has come to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. One must take away sin. 
And his son would be that man. Jesus would die for the sin of the whole world. Not just a certain group, but for the sin of the whole world. All sins from all generations, from Adam to the last person will ever be born, were hurled upon Jesus Christ, and he paid for every single one of them. And I mean this, if you go to hell, it won't be because your sin wasn't paid for. It will be because you have rejected the free gift of salvation. So we see the degradation of man through the fall. You're a fallen human being. Some of y'all have been saved by His wonderful matchless grace. Praise the Lord. But if you're not saved, you're still fallen. You're still bound for hell. It doesn't have to be that way. Christ died for you. He provided a way of salvation. You just have to believe on His name. And when I say believe, you must trust, I mean, in His death, burial, and resurrection. And then we see a time of preparation in this plan of redemption. There's much to say here, but I'll be brief. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament time was a preparation time for the one who would come. He would prepare a world by uh, he would prepare the world by calling out one man, Abraham, and making a great nation out of him, teaching those people of himself and what he expected of them. He would teach them the great need of a sacrifice. By the way, he did that early on too. Soon as Adam and Eve sinned, you know what God did? He came looking for them. I love that. That excites me. And if that don't excite you, if that don't light a fire in your soul, your wood is wet. Amen. Soon as Adam sinned, God came looking. And God is still looking for lost sinners. And when Jesus comes as God down to this earth in the form of a man, He is still looking for sinners. He's looking for sinners in the garden too. You know, I, you know who that was in the garden, by the way? That was Jesus in the garden. The Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. I'm talking about the, the Father, the invisible one. So when He appears to people in the Bible, He's appearing through His Son. The Lord Jesus Christ. He walked with them in the garden. And by the way, it says that Adam and Eve hid themselves when they, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. Huh? Heard a voice walking? Does a voice walk? No, a voice don't walk. But when that voice is the Word of God, the Word is synonymous with voice, and the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ, He was walking in the garden. Looking for Adam and Eve who had sinned, who is hiding from God. He was searching for them. And that's what He's doing today. He's searching for those who are hiding from Him. He's looking and He's seeking to save that which was lost. Amen. Amen. But when He found those two, he, he killed an animal. It doesn't tell us what animal it was. I suppose it was a sheep if I was to guess, although I cannot say for certain. But an animal was killed, and they, he made them coats of skins, it says. They learned a lesson in that, that the works of their own hands, the fig leaves they tied together themselves, was not good enough to cover their nakedness or cover their sin. They must be a covering outside of that. Something innocent must die. There is a great price for this nakedness or for this sin. Something must die to show them how serious it is. And it was a picture or a type of the Lamb of God who would die for our sins to cover us. Not from our nakedness necessarily, but to robe us in His righteousness that we would be suitable to stand before His Father. Amen. Amen. He taught it early on to Cain and Abel too. Cain and Abel evidently could talk to God because they both brought a sacrifice. Amen. The Bible says that Cain was a tiller of the earth. So he brought uh, the fruit of the ground. And we know this, that the ground was cursed when man sinned. So he brought the fruit of his own labors out of a cursed ground. God said, I will accept it. God gave him a chance. He said, if you'll do well, you'll be accepted. But if you don't do well, sin lieth at the gate, he says. And I, I suppose what that means is this, uh, that like a crouching panther there at the gate, it's waiting to pounce on you and destroy you. But he refused to do it right. But Abel knew the right way. 
The Bible says in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 11, but anyways, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Cain brought a more excellent sacrifice. You know what he brought? He brought an animal. Something innocent. Something precious. Its life had to be taken to show uh, the effects of sin and show that the blood uh, can cover the blood of the one who would come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he taught it back then, but he taught it particularly through uh, the children of Abraham. He gave the children of Abraham the law. When Moses led them out of captivity, Moses was given the law there on, on the mountain, Mount Sinai. And the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the law was given to give us a knowledge of sin. They got to learn God's divine standard by the law. And when they saw God's divine standard, uh, they saw that they could not meet it. They had the law, but they couldn't keep the law. Some would brag and say they kept the law, but they were lying and they were deceiving themselves because no man can keep the law except for Jesus Himself, by the way, because He's perfect. They were given the law that they might see uh, that they couldn't keep the law and that they would see the one who could when He would come. Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ who would fulfill the law, every jot and every tittle of it, who would be a, a perfect man and with a perfect life so He could be a perfect sacrifice to take away our sins. Amen? A perfect man plunged man into sin with his transgression when he fell. But a perfect man must pay for sin. Amen. I'll tell you this, if Jesus would have slipped up one time, his sacrifice would not have been acceptable. If he told one life, one falsehood fell from his lips, even as a child, he would not have been an acceptable sacrifice. But since he was perfect, he made that perfect sacrifice. Amen. Which brings us to the next point. We talked about creation. God made everything. We talked about degradation. Man fell. And de degraded himself. And then we talked about preparation here. Where God was preparing uh, for his son to come. But then we see salvation when he actually came. Amen. I think of Galatians 4.4. 4, it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth the son made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. In the fullness of time, Christ stepped out uh, from eternity down into this time uh, we have. And here into this earth. And he lived a perfect life. Died a perfect perfect death to give us a perfect salvation. Amen. Christ came to redeem, it says there in Galatians 4.4. 4. That's why on the cross of Calvary, as He died, as He gave up the ghost, He said, it is finished. You say, what was finished? Not His life, no. He was going to take it up again. His work of redemption was complete on Calvary. Amen. Don't you dare try to add to it. You start adding your miserable works into the, the concoction of salvation, you'll spoil it and you'll run it. I mean, I take this pure water here as being a picture of, 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 of a, a salvation by grace through faith. If I was to go uh, down uh, to the sewage plant and get me a dropper and put it in there and suck up a little bit of that sewage water... It wouldn't matter if I put one drop on her and squeezed the whole bulb out until it, 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 it put all of it, drained all of it into this water. It'd still be nasty and defiled, wouldn't it? Because that sewer water would defile it, whether it be a drop or whether it be a bucket. Amen. And I tell you what, Christ's salvation is perfect and pure. If you put any of your good works in there, it's going to spool it. Amen. It has to be completely on God. I mean, when we go soul winning, we knock on doors and we talk to somebody, I just don't say, are you saved? And when they say, yeah, I walk on, I always ask them why they're saved. Because a lot of people think they're saved for a lot of different reasons. A lot of people think they're saved because they did this or they did that. But it's not what you did, it's what Christ done. He did it all. Many people who call themselves Christians uh, teach a work, works-based salvation. Meaning that you have to do this, you have to do that, and you've got to work towards salvation. But you don't work towards salvation. You're born into salvation in an instant. Amen. I mean, when you're born into this physical world, you're not born over a really long process of time. I mean, it might take hours. 
Maybe you half a day, but it don't take multiple days, multiple weeks and years for you to be born into this world, does it? And you women are like, hey man, it's had children. <laughs> no. And that's not, when you're born into the family of God, it's not a process of years. It happens right there. Amen. And then we get to the last thing I want to point out this morning in this unfolding drama of redemption. The completion of the whole thing. The completion of redemption. I mean, uh, Christ died on Calvary for me. Completing the first act of redemption. There my soul can be redeemed when I put my faith in His death, burial, and resurrection alone. My soul's redeemed right now. I stand before you as a redeemed one. That means I've been bought back or bought with a price. And that price was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm redeemed on the inside. But you know what? My outside ain't redeemed yet. I tell you what, time is marching on. Time is unraveling this old body of mine. Amen. Time's unraveling your body too. But if you've been born again, there's going to be a time when He redeems that old flesh too. Amen. Huh? This corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. And death will be swallowed up with life, friends, when you receive that body fashioned like in the Christ glorious body there at the resurrection from the dead. Then I will be uh, uh, redeemed on the inside and on the outside. Praise the Lord. You looking forward to that day? I mean, you might have some things wrong with you. I think about these folks who have disabilities. These folks are missing limbs or, or some uh, sense in their body. Well, I tell you what, one of these days they're going to be whole and complete. David said, I'll be satisfied when I wake in his likeness. Amen. You'll wake in his likeness too if you've been, complete, if you've been born again. I was about to say completely born again, but you're completely born again the moment you're born again. There ain't no half born again. But here in the book of Revelation, he says it's done. And we need to realize this. The complete, this means the complete redemptive work of Christ. I mean, the earth is even redeemed. You know, the Bible says the earth travaileth. The earth is groaning. Why? Because it's cursed. But you know what? God's going to fix that too. In His whole plan of redemption, He's going to make a new heaven and new earth. Huh? In this new heaven and new earth, it's not going to have those things I mentioned earlier in it. There's not going to be any cemeteries in the new heaven and new earth. Amen. Not a single one. You'll be able to, to walk down the road mile after mile after mile. Walk all the way the whole circumference of the, the, uh, the new heaven and new earth and you'll not find a single graveyard. Because death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire. Amen. Amen. I talked about police stations. There ain't going to be no police stations. That's going to be perfect. There's not going to be waste disposal areas because there'll be no waste. They mean everything is going to be complete. He said in Revelation, it's done. Are you looking for the time when it's done? When he's talking about it being done, he said the former things are passed away and all things have become new. Amen. There'll be no more pain, sickness, sorrow, nor death like the song I sung at the beginning of the service. It'll be a city of gold. Amen. And Jesus will be the king sitting on the throne. Huh? So, if you're saved, take heart. The plan of redemption will be complete. I believe the Lord's about to come in the clouds and do that redeeming of the body if you've been redeemed in the soul. If you've been not been redeemed in the soul, you will not be redeemed in the body and you will not live in that redeemed earth. Amen. You will uh, be corrupt forever in the lake of fire. But I got news, good news for you. You can be redeemed on the inside. You can be saved. Your sin is not so great that His grace and mercy can't cover it when you call upon the name of the Lord. You can be saved. And you can be redeemed in body when He comes in the clouds. And you can live in that redeemed earth, that new heaven and new earth. You just have to put your faith in Him alone. Amen. Do that if you haven't. Let's pray.